Hello, I'm uh, really pleased to be here with you today with an excellent panel to have a conversation about connected places, what they are, what benefits they can bring to communities and businesses, and what we, we might need to worry about as they develop. I'm Erica Lewis, I'm Director of Cybersecurity and Digital Identity at DCMS. And joining me today, I have Professor Greg Clark, Group Advisor, Future Cities and New Industries at HSBC, also chair at the Connected Places Catapult and chair of UK EAG on smart cities and connected communities. I also have Graham Coakley, partner at Urban DNA, Nadira Hussain, who is the director of leadership and development and research at the Society of Innovation, Technology and Modernization, and Dean O, who joins us from NCSC uh, from the capability team. This conversation today is very timely. New technology, like Connected Places, has been much talked about in the last few weeks, including in a podcast last week put out by our Minister for Digital Infrastructure, covering the work of the team in DCMS, looking at security issues around the infrastructure that make up Connected Places and the data that they store and collect. The conversation today is not going to focus on government policy, but our panel are going to help us better understand the context and the opportunities that Connected Places bring to the UK. Greg, for the benefit of the audience, uh, could you uh, give us a bit of an overview of what the concept of a connected place is? Where's that concept come from and how has it evolved and why is it important? I'm delighted to do that, Erica. I'll try to do this in a very simple way. At least since 1980, the population growth of the world has been rapidly accelerating. And it raises the question as to how we can accommodate population growth all over the world in the way that's most efficient. As populations grow, it places stresses on land use, on energy systems and utilities, on transportation, and of course, on real estate. And the core idea here is that the enabling technologies that have evolved at the same time become not just things that affect our working lives, but become tools and instruments in how we manage places so that the settlement of people becomes more efficient and more effective. Just for example, of course, these technologies affect the way we build buildings, the way we operate transport systems, the way our energy, water and utilities work. And we're increasingly finding ways to use that so that over the last 30 years, there's also been a kind of 30 year evolution from smart growth to smart cities, to urban tech, to city 4.0, to place as a service, to connected places. Essentially, the idea here is this, that digitization, and physical places don't exist somehow in opposition to one another, which is how they're often described in the media, but rather that digital platforms can augment and enhance the way places work such that they become more efficient, more customer oriented, more able to be resource uh, sensitive, particularly decarbonization, and it enables, as it were, as IoT and AI-based systems emerge, for us not just to have connected buildings or connected vehicles or connected citizens, but also to have places that become increasingly integrated and connected with one another. Now, this produces all sorts of wonderful and interesting topics. It produces, of course, topics about how we can use this to drive decarbonization, it also produces subjects about how we can use this to drive a new data economy that emerges from it. It raises major cybersecurity issues that, of course, will be tackled shortly. And it also raises all sorts of issues about civic privacy, uh, freedoms and personal rights. So there's a lot of anxiety about this. And then perhaps the last thing to say is that COVID-19, the pandemic, is clearly an accelerator here. 
What's happened is that because COVID-19 has accelerated the use of digital platforms for work, for consumption, for entertainment, for learning, for healthcare, and for other things, it's accelerating our transition towards much more connected places. This gives rise to the possibility that people can lead much more hybrid lives. We both live in a physical space, but we also live in digital domains as well. So many issues have evolved as a result of this. People will tell you that we're now into the third, fourth, perhaps even the fifth generation of connected places. But essentially, the idea here is that digital platforms make places better, more efficient, and easier to live in, thus improving livability, sustainability, efficiency, and potentially productivity as well. Thank you, Greg, for painting that whole picture. I think that's really helpful. Graham, um, in terms of what has happened over the last 20 years and maybe into the next 20 years for citizens from a citizen perspective uh, what do you think we can expect and how do you think things have changed well let me pick up uh, briefly on a couple of points that greg raised um so the the topic of uh, covid um so i'm not going to start from the citizen perspective i'm going to start from from the the, the, the surround um what covid has clearly done is to uh, clarify for cities that they have appalling management of information and data on everything, on places and on people. So that, I think, is is a very positive sense if you actually view it as a challenge in terms of doing something about it. So that COVID as an accelerator is, is a moment in time now which we must not lose. We must use for the, for the benefit. Um, I guess looking backwards, um, picking up on the global population growth that Greg also mentioned. Urbanization is something which we now recognize, not just in the developed world, but across the entire globe. What has transpired is that that's put some focus on big cities. And that's interesting, and that's not altogether too bad, but actually that's not where most people live. Most people live in smaller places, smaller communities, they have less capacity, they have less influence in the market and such like. And I think there's a tipping point at the moment where there's a realization that small places matter. And one of the initiatives that I uh, lead is around small giants, which you only need to say the two words to actually understand what that means, is trying to find the places which are progressive, where most people actually live, and figure out what we can do for those sorts of places to make them better. So I think that context is important. There's a few points which I think are important for us at a big picture level. One is the realization that we're living in a globally connected world. Um, and secondly, the intensity and the frequency of the challenges that we face. So whether that's plastics in the sea or fish availability or plastics in fish, which unfortunately is the reality of what we face at the moment, or security issues in places. Um, we're now realizing that this is not going to go away. And from a citizen perspective, now comes the point of citizens must take accountability to be active participants in the system. And that, for me, is the most important thing for us to focus on. The question of the next 20 years is an interesting one, because right now we sit in something we call the decade of action. And I look at that first year or so of the decade of action and say, have I seen institutions and have I seen people change? The answer is absolutely not. So what we need to do is to figure out how we're going to change the way we actually deal with things. How are we going to transform? This isn't just slow change this is transformative change and i think that the question of what's going to happen over the next 20 years will be answered in the next few years we'll go in one direction or the other i was delighted to see that the us has actually picked up the chalice and is supporting trying to live in a better and more sustainable world so directionally it'd be good to see us move in that level in terms of specifics i think there'll be pervasive ambient technologies i think that data will be 
used where you can really extract the power of it, for instance, to heal. As an example, um, in Scotland, they've done some research that says of all the data that's held in the public sector about people on their health, only 16% of that data is used by health professionals to make decisions about your health. So there's an awful lot of potential in terms of data that's held in lots and lots of silos. So the intriguing thing about data is data can be used for good, for profit, and for evil. And we need to understand how to manage the balance of that. So perhaps I'll pause at that point and let uh, that sink in and move on. Thanks, Erica. That's wonderful, Graham. I, I, I think that the picture that we are beginning to see is a really interesting one where uh, the, the barrier between the sort of digital and physical is really disappearing and the opportunities are really quite great. Um, Nadira, uh, local government is really at the heart of all of this, or at least it, it, it can be, um, and the local level fabric of connected places needs to be shaped. How are local authorities bringing this technology into places and what can it help them achieve? Thank you. Um, thank you, Erica. Thank you, colleagues, for, for the um, really helpful context and scene setting that you have already presented in terms of bringing this subject to life. Um, what I'd like to do is just um, explore a little bit further from um, the local government, the council's perspective, because Connected places really resonate with us and now even more so through what we've experienced in response to the pandemic where um, our intervention and response to especially the most vulnerable people in our communities has been something that we have had to um, res you know, respond to absolutely as a primary focus from a place-based perspective. And I'd like to really emphasise from Socotim's perspective, the thought leadership around um, the place-based outcomes for communities is receiving priority focus as we speak. We've more recently devised our ethical digital placemaking model, which has been predicated on Kate Raworth's donut economics model, where the actual safe space for our healthy and well communities is in the centre of that donut. Traverse internally, and you're impacting socioeconomic factors such as housing, employment, health, education, and traverse externally. And we therefore hit aspects such as um, the ecological uh, factors such as climate change, lack of biodiversity, pollution, etc. So we've already started thinking about how we translate this into um, practical dimensions and means using the investment in technology, digital solutions, data and infrastructure that, that we've already um, alluded to, to aid and facilitate those better community outcomes. And if I reference our um, Digital Re Trends Report 2021, it's absolutely highlighted the need to consolidate the unfinished business of accelerated digital methods in 2020 that both Greg and, and Graham have referred to. Um, coupled with renewal, a fundamental shift to localism and urban redesign, brokering and facilitating better sustainable outcomes for people and places. And we also need to ensure that supply chains and suppliers will need to be rethought to match the requirements of the specific times, creating ecosystems of trust and innovation. And data, as Graham has already alluded to, has become a major consideration too. The need for ethical, open and transparent harnessing of data has never been as apparent in building public trust, confidence and behaviours. And the timely and accurate data will be a major consideration as local governments seek to lead place-based uh, renewal and resilience. And that's another terminology, the resilient communities that we are now trying to create as a response to the pandemic has been prioritised even further. And in terms of emerging technologies then, let's focus on the technologies and, and data uh, for a second. They too will accelerate during 2021 and beyond. And we've identified through this, this trends report some priority, uh, primary priorities, including IoT, cybersecurity, low code development, AI, cloud com computing and video conferencing. And in the secondary priority category, 5G, 
drones, driverless cars, mobility as a service, and gamification. Now, if we took the IoT as a specific example, public sector CIOs specifically report that they expect to see a rapid and increased de deployment of IoT devices and low-cost wireless networks to support remote monitoring, smart buildings and adaptive civic infrastructure. And IoT devices will also deliver large amounts of new data-derived intelligence that can help to inform policy and decision-making, especially in civic and community planning. So just broadly then, if we are to consider the high level benefits to be gleaned through the adoption and deployment of technologies and data, smart working places, an improved response to inclusion and inequality. What we've seen firsthand is that social inequality being heightened through the response to the pandemic, where we can use data far more effectively to target those who are vulnerable in terms of access to connectivity or devices. What are the workarounds? How do we help these people? Technologies that promote independence and well-being through the use of digital services and data are now increasingly important. And building on some of the concepts already discussed around citizens and focusing on them, well, service design has heightened once again to meet cit citizen, service design has heightened to meet citizen and public expectation. I already mentioned the point about localism and uh, urban redesign. In all areas, whether urban, semi-rural or rural, we expect to see a renewed focus on the civic digital infrastructure and connectivity to stimulate local economies and to put the quality of life, to improve the quality of life for citizens. And then of course, the economy, employment, skills, training, economic regeneration, and a final call out for the environment, which once again, we have touched on very briefly earlier, but aspects such as climate change, intelligent energy, use in buildings, renewable energy, street lighting, and transport planning, just to mention a few areas specifically where we can see that the technologies and data will absolutely start to, to help us achieve far more benefit. Thank you. Adira, thank you very much. Dean, um, we've heard from the rest of the panel about the uh, opportunities of uh, connected places. And, and I think Nadira just gave us a really good picture of the complexity of this kind of issue. Um, NCSC have been working on connected places for a short while now. Could you give a bit, bit of a sense of the key issues from a cybersecurity perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think first I'd like to acknowledge, you know, the discussion from, from um, my colleagues on the panel and really recognise that we do see connected places as, you know, providing a range of critical services and, and that they have the potential to transform the way we govern and operate our built environment. And we are increasingly looking to technology and data to make improvements to the quality of our life and for us to kind of you know, deliver efficiencies in the way we, we deliver services. I think it's really important that we, we start by recognizing uh, these real significant benefits and that we encourage innovation. I think it's also equally important that we identify, understand, and mitigate the associated risks. I think with connected places, you know, they rely on the collection and processing of huge amounts of data. And whilst this does enable a data-driven approach to the governance and operation of a connected place, it does mean that data has to be collected and stored. And you know, some of that data could well be, you know, bulk personal sensitive data. And we need to consider how all these sources might aggregate in places and, uh, you know, add additional risk to privacy. I think with any bulk data store, you know, there's going to be threats of attack and risk of accident. And we really have to protect this high value sensitive information from a range of hostile actors. And I think it's clear from, you know, the various incidents reported um, the extraordinary lengths that our adversaries and actors will go to to obtain data of this nature. For those controlling connected places, there, there is reputational risk. You know, if this data is lost, stolen or misused in any way, it, it will have an impact. And equally, there could be legal risk if the connected place isn't 
designed and compliant with relevant legislation. So I'll point out the GDPR, the Data Protection Act, and you know, depending on the system that we're talking about, potentially health and safety and network information systems regulations. I think coming back to the point on critical services, we need to make sure that these services are resilient and they're not easily disrupted by cyber attack. You know, if a connected place is compromised, there will you know, be potential impact on local citizens. And we need to make sure we do everything that we can to minimize this disruption and that safety is never compromised. I think to, to go to technologies and make a point on that, connected places are complex. You know, they rely on the deployment of heterogeneous technologies across a range of diverse infrastructure. And we need to really understand these technologies, both as they emerge and converge in connected places um, and make sure that we're securing them in an appropriate fashion. So I guess just to summarize, it's really key that we protect the data that is obtained and that we ensure that critical services are resilient. Thank you, Dean. Um, yes, we're beginning to paint a really uh, interesting picture where it feels like we've been potentially on the cusp of something in the, in the story that Graham told about the evolution of, um, of these kinds of places, but also somewhere where um, leadership is going to be really key. And Nadira, we, we've already, you, you've, you've outlined the vital role that local government's going to be playing in um, shaping the cities of the future. Uh, and that even the small places of the future, as Graham pointed out, so this is not just about cities. Uh, what sort of leadership do you think that actually requires and how do we involve communities in that? Um, so thank you, Erica, once again. Um, I think the last few years, but specifically the pandemic, has um, demonstrated that digital and tech adoption can both save money, improve services. Um, if attention is paid to the changing working practices and adopting new risk models. So that that's a given. Um, we acknowledge that simply bolting on new technologies and existing ways of working does not optimise digital op opportunity. The real success of, of the digital shift within um, the workforce and the communities is less about the technologies, but more about the willingness of people to adapt, changing cultures, behaviour and, and absolutely the point that you make around leadership styles. And we have seen firsthand from the practitioners that we've been working with over the last 12 to 18 months how this has come into play in full force. And we've, we've identified a number of clear priorities from a leadership perspective. So I just want to reel off four of those clear priorities, Erica. First, consolidate. So carefully reviewing the changed working practices which have been introduced over the last 12 to 18 months that could negatively impact on security, resilience or cost, but resolve any unfinished business. So how are we going to now accelerate and move things forward given we've had to work in a drastically different way? The second point is to build on the digital momentum that's been um, created, prioritizing further change in digital programs and ICT plans that will help organizations achieve their ambitious goals and to improve the outcomes for its communities. So it's really focusing and building on, on some of the initial foundations and success. The ability to innovate using newfound opportunities and experiences to create and deploy innovative solutions. And finally, and I can't emphasize this enough, the, the, the um, ability to collaborate and the need to, to outwardly focus working with a, a wide or a broad range of stakeholders offering different um, and often challenging perspectives and the ICT investment can make digital progress and a wider smart, uh, smart places agenda far more fruitful. Local authorities cannot do this on their own. They are absolutely dependent on working with our partner supplier community, other public sector agencies such as health, the blue light, academia. Um, and we've got to leverage the benefit of our collective expertise if we're seriously going to make a difference and 
achieve the the ambitions outlines that we have all uh, indicated just now. And what I'd like to do is to, to bring this example to life. So where has this leadership developed some real tangible outcomes and, and benefits? And I've got three distinct examples that I want to share with you. The first is around data. Now, Barkingham Dagenham Council in East London have made some phenomenal progress in terms of the use of data intelligence and insight. Um, they've created a social progress index, which um, allows them to really focus from an evidence-based perspective to highlight areas of deprivation across their borough. And they have been very, very clear that they are going to target their resources in a very meaningful way to overcome aspects such as uh, gambling addiction and unemployment and um, children uh, taken into care at a young age. But, but um, in response to the pandemic, even targeting vulnerable people and getting food parcels out to them has been absolutely a priority using this uh, evidence-based data. The second example is Sunderland. So they have created our city plan, their ambition by 2030 to be an international city. In 2019, just running up to, to some of the more recent projects in 2019, 30 leaders from the health um, sector, education, the business community and major employers, so the point around collaboration and joining up, um, came together to, to create their 5G ready communications ring, which enabled free Wi-Fi, free ultra fast Wi-Fi, I should say, to the high street and uh, main entertainment areas. They're currently searching for 5G neutral host venture partners, a 20 year partnership to deliver ubiquitous 5G across Sunderland itself. Um, and they are establishing an acceleration program and localized challenge fund to encourage IoT 5G led business creation, innovation and growth. And their aspiration is to support 500 new tech startups in the next five years. How ambitious is that? And finally, bringing it back to home, Westminster, they have created um, a digital toolkit, which is maximizing connectivity across um, urban landscape. They were, just for information, 638th out of 650 uh, local authorities for super fast availability, um, which really motivated them to improve connectivity and availability across the borough. They're now ranking first across London and 13th in the whole of the UK. And it's been the highest full fiber rollout possible. Now, input and investment such as this, they have been able to further build some projects which will allow residential voucher schemes to target those who still have um, connectivity issues. And they have another example project in place which will help with the digital inclusion initiative um, to train up residents to become digital inclusion ambassadors, upskilling both themselves and others in the community. So some real tangible examples of where this kind of inward investment connected places delivering some real benefit and outcomes. Brilliant. And you paint a really nice picture of we can't do this alone. So, um, Greg, I wanted to really dig into the role of the private sector here. It's clear that they play a significant role, um, both in the UK and I guess around the globe. Can you give a bit of a sense of how the private sector are viewing this and what the challenges are that they're facing? Very happy to do that, Erica. And, you know, I spend most of my time in my day job working with HSBC's 45,000 clients who are sort of in this space. So I, I suppose that the simple way to start is to say that companies that are in place-based industries like real estate, like mobility, utilities, infrastructure, energy, if you like, those big kind of uh, place-based uh, sectors, all of them are currently uh, being either disrupted by or they're embracing the opportunities of AI, of IoT, of platformization, and of the opportunity to use that to drive a new kind of innovation model or business model. So every day of every week, 
I meet a real estate company that's involved in the shift from real estate as an asset to real estate as a service. Or I meet a mobility company that's moving from providing a single kind of transportation to a more integrated mobility as a service model, integrating micro mobility with big system mobility, for example. Or I meet a utility company that's moving from providing water or energy or waste management or something like that on a singular basis to doing it now much more through integrated platforms. And for all companies in these industries, um, this is a big process of change. It's a process of opportunity. It's a very active area of uh, mergers and acquisitions, of um, you know uh, IPOs and other things. It's very, very, very rapidly emerging. And then companies that are based in what we might call place-based citizen services, entertainment, retail, hospitality, and others, all of these platform technologies are changing the way they interact with their customers. They're enabling them to become more hybrid, more omni-channel, simultaneously providing what we might call face-to-face -face and face-to-place services, but also what we might call face-to-space services where they do things in a kind of digital way so this is going on it's it's a huge revolution it's the fourth industrial revolution in the place-based industries right but there's a kind of secondary effect of this that's happening which is we're seeing what's usually called sector convergence where previously separated sectors are now becoming more integrated with one another as a result of this platform effect. So just to give you an example, the, the thing we call the sharing economy is in fact this translation of things that were previously seen as assets or products becoming services so that we shift from ownership to usership. That has the effect of prioritizing the channels through which the service is received, which means that single channels can start to provide very different kinds of products. So uh, uh, um, uh, ch channels that deliver things to your door can deliver you hot food, or they can deliver you fashion items, or they can indeed deliver you medical equipment. So you're beginning to see some convergence there of a whole series of different industries through sharing platforms into a new kind of circular economy, a new sharing economy. The second one is the circular economy, where you begin to see that waste, water, uh, utilities, other kinds of energy, food, as they begin through these platforms and through convergence technologies to become more integrated with one another, you're seeing a kind of urban metabolism or a place-based metabolism emerging as a kind of an industrial cluster. Um, another one would be what we might call urban services or place services, where real estate, uh, engineering, infrastructure and others begin to merge so that individual companies build buildings and provide buildings, but they also operate a whole series of underground services that they supply to others engineering companies are acquiring planning consultancies, real estate companies are becoming energy companies themselves. There's a lot of integration going on here. And then perhaps the, the third thing that we could say uh, about this is that for all of these companies, this is a kind of very rapidly emerging market where the more they're able to, in a certain place, develop demonstrators, uh, kind of innovation locations, they're able to showcase how they do this, the more they're able to prove the concept of the way they're doing it, and they're able to move towards then expanding what they offer in other places. Underpinning all of this, of course, is IT companies of one kind or another. And uh, as Graham knows very well, and he may comment on this in a minute, those IT companies have been through a very rapid journey. So that's one thing. The second thing that underpins this is, of course, is that a huge secondary economy in data begins to emerge, 
where you can now see that, you know, we talk about data as the new oil or data as the new currency, picking up the points made by Dean very importantly, that as it were, the secondary market effects in data is very important. And then the third thing, of course, is that for finance, particularly for a bank like the one where I work, this produces huge numbers of micro transactions that become themselves a whole new ocean of new forms of, of trade. Uh, and other things. And therefore, the financial services industry has to track and follow all of this. But what does it come back to? It comes back to this idea that if you have connected buildings, connected utilities, connected transport and connected citizens, you're increasingly creating a connected place. And that gives rise then to all the issues that have already been mentioned about the need for that to be carefully aggregated, to be organized, to be led, to be sequenced. It's not just e-government, it's e-place. And public and private have to cooperate together to make that work. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, Graham, um, we're not the only uh, country in the world that's looking at <laughs> connected places i'm sure uh, and i know you go and visit many other places that are doing this and probably uh, slightly more advanced than we are can you just take us through a couple of really good examples and um have a think uh, if you could tell us a little bit about the underpinning technologies as well that would be really good sure um i, I i've been listening in and reflecting i think there's there's something very important that connects what dean was saying and what uh, Nadir is saying in terms of um, uh, a few things. One is capacity building. Um, the second is commonality. Sometimes people call that standards. And the third is some examples, um, examples that can stimulate, um, that, that are contextualized, contextualized to my place. We're all unique, but we're all the same. And cities are much the same sort of thing. So with that as a scene set, you know, where is it that people are doing things well? Well, the important thing is to understand the context of where they're playing. Um, I tend to profile America, very commercial, very technical, technological, Asia Pacific, very technological and extremely good at it. And Europe is very much more in terms of the uh, well, it's very heterogeneous for starters, which means it's very relevant, which is a very powerful position to play as Europe and the UK. Um, and it's very sustainable. So we actually worry about society a bit more and interact with society more, worry about uh, e ecology and environment and such like. Who's doing it well? Um, well, I would suggest that from a technological standpoint, places like South Korea, Seoul and such like, have got uh, definitely got a head start on, on us. And I think that there's an opportunity to learn from what they're up to. Um, and uh, put down any sense of arrogance and really sit there and listen in and think. So to Greg's point about place, how can we help transform, leapfrog cities from trying to struggle to put data platforms in place to putting digital twins in place with 3D visualization and all these sorts of things in a secure and in a value adding way. How can we leapfrog? Because that's what's required. And I would look towards the Asia Pacific area to have a look at examples there. Closer to home, um, I would offer that I believe as a, as a nation, Spain, which five to 10 years ago was the sort of active teenager in terms of smart cities, um, is now probably, in my view, the most advanced in Europe. Why? Because they've got a ministerial declaration that says this is important. They've got a very, very large number of cities operating collaboratively. They've engaged the standardization agency in a really, really quality way. And they've got both big and small cities in action. Uh, the big city that people will know, Barcelona, is a very good example of a city that, despite a change in mayors and fundamental change in terms of how they view things, has got an awful lot of good examples. Another area where I think two other cities that come to mind in Europe, where they, they 
understand society in slightly different ways and are actually building society actively into what happens is Copenhagen and Amsterdam. Amsterdam, very eager, active. They're a city that absorbs the the donut model that uh, Nadir was talking about. And they're very experimental in terms of what they do with technology. Whereas Copenhagen, in my view, is quietly experimental and more socially uh, active. And I guess the, the last thing that comes to mind is, a, is an example. So um, we talk about Paris and the 15-minute city. I have in my mind the five-minute city. And uh, specifically around how do you transform a way that a city breathes its people and goods in and out on a daily basis. So how do you change that in the new world? How do you do it so that as we move towards um, electric, uh, renewable, better transport, it doesn't mean that the people that can afford a rather fancy new electric vehicle can have a charging point outside their house and everything's fine for those that have got money that can buy electric cars. How do you shift it towards multimodal, shared, convenient transport? How do you make a five-minute city? Five minutes from my front door, I can get to a point anywhere in, in my place where I can actually actively engage in a variety of different um, transport to move me from point A to point B, dependent on what um, my age, my characteristics are. And for me, that shared model, which picks up uh, Greg's point about the, the, the sharing economy and the move from product to service, that therefore requires that we have private sector, public sector convening, importantly, and people actively engaged in using multiple assets in very, very different ways and understanding how data is used for, um, for good, for profit, and hopefully not for evil in that. Um, and I think if we can come up with examples where cities are doing these sorts of things and the neat thing on the idea of a shared, multimodal, clean, green, healthy transport model, the five minute city, that's already started in Europe. So in the UK, there are some cities that are active in that. There are a number of projects in Europe on active on that. And, and one that I'm currently dealing with as one of the programs is Milan. So they're trying to put in a shared mobility model which hopefully visionary will be the five minute city idea. So there is uh, some examples of where I think we should look to learn from other parts of the globe, as well as learn from Europe. And the final point would be, let's not forget the undeveloped or the developing world. That's where the mother of invention, that's where need is. And there's an awful lot that we can learn because they're transforming, they're leapfrogging. We need to help them. And we need to learn from their innovations as well. Thank you, Graham. I'm I'm really aware that we've got a time clock on us now. So, um, Dean, I'm going to pass to you. Uh, and maybe this is a bit of a wrap up. So I think we've got a really um, interesting picture here of, of, a, of places where you can live as a citizen and sort of almost let it happen to you uh, or you can engage. But inside of that, there are some real questions about how you behave and how you operate and how you keep yourself safe. So, um, Dean, uh, what do you think uh, the best kinds of examples of best practice that we can uh, plug into as individuals or local authorities or businesses um, and, and, and make sure that we keep ourselves safe? Yeah, absolutely. So I want to start by saying that we at the NCSC are working on some general security principles and these will help those responsible in designing and operating um, connected places to do so in a secure manner. I think the, the, the insights today on the panel have been incredibly useful and they paint a picture of complexity and transformation. And I think what, what we want to encourage, encourage really is a strategic approach to the development of these connected places and one that really makes a conscious decision to prioritize security. You know, and, and that has a designated and accountable authority we need, we need to make sure that connected places are designed securely. For example, we're making sure that architectures are designed so that they are difficult to compromise um, and that we are making services um, resilient so they can maintain critical levels of operation in the face of cyber attack. I think people need to consider the threats that your connected places face and, and the vulnerabilities within there. I think you should really be seeking to reduce exposure 
And you know, this can be achieved by a whole range of mechanisms. Some technical examples of mitigation might be the use of firewalls, switching off unused services and closing unnecessary ports. You know, please do not use default passwords. Uh, make sure you're having access controls and you're deploying least privilege. Um, and try to adopt secure development practices. I think one key challenge will be around understanding what infrastructure you have and how it is connected. You know, being aware of the interdependencies that exist. And I think this depth of understanding of your connected place will really help you to make informed decisions around how you can protect your infrastructure. I think the same depth of understanding should also be true of your supply chain. You know, understanding who is in your supply chain, the, the security measures that they have in place, and making sure that you have clearly defined roles and responsibilities and that you have clear service level agreements um, with your suppliers. I think you really have to understand the data that you are collecting and processing, making sure that you're protecting it both you know, at rest and in transit. And, and you know what, when you're identifying the data you want to collect because you recognize the associated benefits, do the risk assessment. Try and identify you know, what risks are presented by holding that data because it will help you to make a more tailored approach to data security. And I think we, we have to consider aggregation. You know, as, as all these data sources arise, you know, what are the potential risks um, to privacy as a result of the aggregation of data? One thing I want you to take away is, is really a kind of mindset of being prepared. So anticipate and prepare for security inc incidents. Make sure you kind of have mitigations ready to minimize disruption. I mean, you, you should have an incident management plan and you should know what your critical services and functions are. And a key message really around this is, is build for re resilience, but plan for recovery and know what your responsibilities are in the event of a data breach and make sure you have you know, procedures in place to handle such events. I think finally, there's something around whole like the life cycle management. You know, security and technology requirements evolve over time, um, and you should really plan ahead and adopt a sustainable engineering approach to a connected place. You know, you should be thinking about how how are you going to roll out updates, how are you going to patch vulnerabilities. You know, what does your asset management look like? Um, and I think another real challenge will be around legacy components and how we manage the integration with those or ideally, you know, plan to replace and upgrade them. And I think from the outset, you really need to think about end of life for component and systems um, and making sure that you have clear processes and responsible parties um, for making that happen. I think actually one final note from a citizen perspective, it's just about being mindful of the data that you're generating and sharing. Um, you know, keeping your, your personal devices updated and protected. And I think you know, if, you, if you want more information, go to the NCSC website. There's a, there's a whole range of advice and guidance, and it can really help you keep your knowledge on cybersecurity up to date. Thank you, Dean. Um, I think that's a really good way of wrapping up. Uh, thank you so much to the whole panel today who've painted, I think, an incredible picture of a world that is coming. Um, which will be uh, much better than the world than we're, that we're in. But I think Dean has reminded us nicely at the end that we must go into that consciously and strategically and think about how we behave to make those places safe. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.